What's up, everybody? Uh, feels like we just did this on Sunday. I feel like we're in the same spots, except for maybe Lewis. But um, we recorded a whole podcast earlier uh, discussing all the offensive coordinator candidates and what we think was going to go down in the next, you know, 24, 48 hours. But uh, that's down the drain now. So we're hopping on a Zoom here. Uh, Colton Sully, Lewis Razor, Jason Batakiao, Seth Luttrell, um, and Joe John Finley. Uh, reportedly going to be hired uh, as co-offensive coordinators. That's according to our buddies over there at Soonerscoop.com. Um, Seth Luttrell, it sounds like, according to the report, will work with the quarterbacks, um, specifically five-star freshman Jackson Arnold, who has indicated that he, to multiple uh, sources, that he is going to remain in Norman for his sophomore season. Um, Joe John Finley will uh, continue to coach the tight ends, it sounds like, and um also be elevated to co-offensive coordinator title um i would expect guys seth latrell to handle the main play calling duties um but that has not yet been indicated uh immediate reactions uh lewis jason what do you guys think of the in-house route that brent venables took and the continuity that we talked about earlier and just how important that is and uh yeah just overall what do you guys think of the uh, the, uh, the reported hires yeah. yeah, well, I mean, we just talked about it earlier, obviously, and I think, you know, one of my points was, is going in-house kind of too safe entering the SEC? I guess we'll see. I mean, there are certainly advantages of it. Number one, Jackson Arnold coming into the hardest conference in college football into a schedule that is just insanely tough. He won't have to learn a completely different offense, a completely different scheme. Um, so that's definitely a positive um, but yeah, it, it'll be interesting. I think the dynamic part of it is going to be the most interesting part. Who takes over in crucial uh, situations? Who has the, the main say? Because it's got to be one of them between Joe John um, and obviously Seth Luttrell. Um, but yeah, Joe John, I think it's huge that they even kept him on staff because that's a guy who has been with Levy throughout basically his entire coaching career. Um, and you kind of expected that the pull towards Mississippi State was going to be big for him. But uh, I don't know. We'll see what happens. I, I think it's interesting. And yeah. We'll get to the to uh, Soonerscoop.com's reporting that, you know, Levy tried to pull Latrell, uh, Joe John, and, and other staff members. But it looks like just some GAs and no position coaches will be headed to Starkville. Um, I mean, and you've got to think – and. I've been talking to some people that have indicated this as well, but um, you would think with Seth Luttrell's experience, I mean, he called plays at Oregon, North Carolina, or not Oregon, Arizona, Indiana, North Carolina. He was a head coach at North Texas for multiple years. You would expect him to handle most of the play calling duties um, just based off his experience, but um, huge in my mind, not only to keep Joe John, but uh Sooner Scoops reporting no other staff members, which means no Emmett Jones. And we talked about that earlier, just like how huge it is to keep Emmett around. Uh, Jason, what did you think of the, the report tonight? Yeah, I thought it was, I mean, as expected. Um, I mean, we kind of assumed, and I, I said this earlier in the podcast today, I said if it was Seth Luttrell, I, I fully expected OU to go co-offensive coordinator route, which they did with Joe John Finley. Um, like you said, I mean, I think it's huge to keep all the guys that are in full-time positions uh, around on staff, especially Joe John Finley, DeMarco, uh, and, it, and the list goes on, uh, just for continuity's sake for Jackson. Um, and, and I think keeping that continuity is big to keep Jackson around as well. Not that he was going to leave, but in a sense of – you don't want your five-star quarterback who's been learning a playbook for an entire season and spring even to walk into the SEC, which is the toughest conference in all of football, to be learning a, a brand new playbook. I, I think OU went the safe route, but I think it's also the smart route in the sense of their play caller next year, which is Jackson Arnold. Yeah, guys, uh, talking to a couple people here tonight, tonight and just they're indicating like um you know seth is a guy that uh will work as hard as possible to get things done and people don't expect you know OU's offense to skip a beat at all uh even with jeff levy leaving and then joe john has been described to me as 
just an, a very, very intellectual guy. And we talked to him, I've talked to him a couple of times and we've talked to him, you know, uh, during media days and such preseason and just a really, really smart guy. Um, but another key piece of this, and, and people have told me this and uh, just kind of figured throughout the whole process that, um, and, and we've heard Bill Biedenboe talk about South the Trail a lot in the past, but I think that guy is going to be key uh, to this whole thing work. And I think Bill Biedenboe is probably that key piece that that's going to help Seth Luttrell and Joe, John Finley find their footing here. Um, just based off, you know, I mean, obviously Bill was with Seth in Arizona. Um, they remain close friends. I mean, Bill even tweeted last year when North Texas fired Seth, like that they made the wrong decision. Uh, he was obviously excited to have him on staff this year, but I think Bill, I don't know what you guys think, but I think just that continuity at the offensive line um, and previous experience calling an offense with Seth is just going to be huge for, for this offense. Yeah, 100%. And look no further than the guys he's developed on that offensive line. And obviously they had a down year this year, but keeping Biedenboe around, I mean, he is, if I'm not mistaken, the longest tenured um, current OU coach by a lot, I would assume. Um so, yeah, keeping him around is, is just huge, and everybody for that matter. I mean, you lose Emmett Jones, you got to think how many of those wide receiver recruits that committed this summer are going with him. Um, so that's going to be huge if they really do keep him. Um, so, yeah, I think I think running it back is not a bad choice at all. Yeah, I think another big thing, I mean, Joe John Finley and, and Jeff Lebby, from my understanding, would probably be – the primary recruiters for Davon Mitchell. And I think keeping Joe John around for next year, it, you know, tightens up any doubts that people might've had about Davon Mitchell. I know he uh, confirmed or reconfirmed his commitment to OU like yesterday in a tweet, but I mean, we all know how recruits are. They could flip like that. Um, so I, I like just from a recruiting standpoint, I think it's huge because you have, guys that have been around all these recruits you they know them these are familiar faces and just from that 2024 even 2025 recruiting class like it's not it, there's going to be continuity and there's just it's just going to be an extension of, of what levy was already doing so i think that's another big part as well yeah, guys, not much I don't think else we could talk about here. I think it's huge that OU obviously kept kept the staff members they did. Big news that that these two in-house candidates are going to replace Jeff. Um, I think Seth has a lot of experience. Obviously, you know, head coach for multiple seasons. It's hard to win at North Texas. Obviously has an offensive background. Worked with Nick Foles at Arizona. Uh, helped develop him. Um, you know, Joe John Finley has coached in the SEC. He's coached at Missouri. He's coached at Texas A&M. He's coached at Ole Miss. Uh, I think that that's a key piece of this as well, is that he's got significant SEC background and, and knows those defenses and um, knows the type of tight ends, not only tight ends, but players uh, that are needed in the SEC. So, um, you know, uh, I think they're they're solid hires. Um, I think OU did look nationwide and tried to go – you know, looked at some outside guys, but I think it was important for Brent to stay in house and and just keep this train, you know, chugging forward with this with the guys that he brought in. Um, but you know, stick with this podcast. We still have a lot of good things to come. Uh, we talked bowl game. We got Gracie Rawlings, our, our men's basketball beat writer, uh, to come on the show and and talk about you know McCaslin game and just how OU's been doing this season. They're ranked number twenty five for the first time in Porter Moser era. Um, so lots of good stuff. Stick it here. Keep it with the pod. Let's talk portal candidates now. Who Who's either in the portal now from other schools that OU could target? I know it's early, um, but also who are some candidates from OU to maybe, you know, jump in that portal and, and kind of look around at other schools? I, I, I can go ahead and jump in on people that I think will probably transfer from OU. I think Javante Barnes is a candidate that will probably jump in the portal. Um, I mean, he went from being expected to be the number one guy alongside alongside Gavin Sawchuk to like not even playing um, and probably likely for injury. I, I think he'll probably be looking for a fresh start. I think Brennan Thompson maybe could be on that list. Um, maybe, you know, this uh, talking to his mom, 
early, early in the year um, before that OU Texas game. I mean, injuries really hampered him uh, at Texas, and that was the reason why he wanted a fresh start. And I mean, the their track coach I think was let go, and similarly to OU, their track coach just got let go. Um, you know, I maybe he just needs another fresh start, but maybe not. Who knows? Um, those are two guys on the offensive end of the ball that really come to mind. Um, defensively, I mean, I, I can't really think of other people other than like some maybe bottom tier. No, not bottom tier. Let me rephrase. Just guys on the depth chart that didn't get any playing time. Yeah, I, I think offensively, I like the names you mentioned. I'm wondering about Savion Bird. I yeah, mean, you come in, you're right. the starter, and then you lose that job. And now Caden Green looks great. Jacob yep. Sexton looks great. There are a lot of young guys on that offensive line who, I mean, they it, it bodes well for OU in the future. Yep. So it'll be interesting to see what he does. Um, defensively, I can't help but think Jaron Kanick. Like, his yeah. playing time declined so much, mm-hmm. and, like, so did this play. And plus, you got Kobe McKenzie, Kip Lewis, young linebackers, again, for OU coming in. Yeah. Um, and then you got to think on the D-line, maybe somebody. Like, yeah, I mean, PJ is going to be a sophomore next year. You've got that, that power line, as they call it, coming in I would, not too long from now. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I am pretty sure Reggie Grimes has, like, one year of – eligibility left i could be wrong but i think he could be a guy that could enter the portal um after this year if he does i mean he didn't play in like what the final four or five games uh whether it was for injury or not i could see him entering the portal because you know or maybe even an r mason thomas you know really talented guy you know up and down here maybe he needs a fresh start but that really might just be a stretch I, I could see our Mason because he's, I mean, we know the talent that he has, yeah. but like Ethan Downs, he's not moving from his spot. Right. Um, obviously, you've got PJ mm-hmm. who's on the come up. Um, so, yeah, I could see that, but I'm really wondering about Savion. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, I think the names y'all mentioned are good. I think Javante wouldn't shock me just based on Gavin kind of proving either Javante or a, like a Tawi Walker would surprise me. Um, yeah. Cause just based on. Gavin cementing his place and Taylor Tatum coming in next year. Um, wouldn't be shocked if Javante and Tawi kind of hit the portal. Mm. Um, I think Savion's a good one. I'm trying to think here. Jaron is a good one. I kind of go the other way. Uh, I think you guys said R. Mason. I wonder, and he, he doesn't seem to be like an obvious choice for this, but just as you're going through the depth chart and going through the recruits coming in and everything, Maybe this is not this year, but maybe next year. I, th- I kind of wonder about Ethan Downs. Like, I know yeah. you guys go Art Mason. I kind of wonder maybe about an Ethan Downs. Um, just trying to think in the secondary and linebackers. This is, uh, I would uh, Let me throw out a name, and this might be a stretch because he just came to OU, and like yeah. you know the upside that he brings. But Dayson didn't get – and obviously he was yeah. battling injuries throughout the year, well, but he didn't it's get – It's going to depend on Justin though. Harrington's waiver, I think, as yeah. well. Yeah. But I, that's what I was just about to say. There's a lot of linebackers and there's a lot of players in the secondary. I think there's too many. Ta- high, high, and you never – if you're OU, that's a good problem to have. Uh, that's what the Alabamas and the Georgias have, and you see right. transfers from there every year. Right. Um, but I think that that's – they have a lot of high-end talent in that linebacker – core that's coming in and that's already here and in the secondary but i could see a couple surprising maybe younger names that just got here kind of maybe jumping in the portal but that's all speculation we, you know we obviously uh we'll have to wait and see um we're not really we haven't really ramped up any uh signing day or recruiting stuff guys but are there any names out there that possibly you could see maybe um, flipping their commitments either from OU or to OU, or are there any names coming up that, you know, on signing day that, you know, you guys are kind of waiting to, to look, or is that a little too early? For uh, I would say Davon Mitchell. Obviously, he reaffirmed his commitment, but, like, you got to wonder with the speculation about Joe John maybe joining Levy. You have to wonder about that. Is um, from California? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the only name that really comes to mind. It's tough to know, like, the mindset the guys are in, obviously. but I think you would like to get, and this is just throwing it out there, but I think you'd like to get either whether it's in the 2020, I mean, you've got, I don't know. Actually, 
Never mind. I, I don't know where I was going with that. Jason, you got anything? I would keep an eye on Williams in the winery. I mean, is, is that how you say his name? Uh, no, yeah. Uh, God, I suck at names. Um, I would keep an eye on him. I mean, OU was in the front before, you know, eventual, I think, last-minute commitment for whatever reason. You know, I don't know what goes through recruits' heads. But, um, I mean, we saw it with Peyton Bowen last year. You know, he was – he was, you know, locked in on Notre Dame, and then it looked like Oregon, what, which he literally committed to, um, and then, you know, whatever happened with his N- NLI or whatever it's called, um, didn't sign it, ended up at OU. Um, I think, you know, I think Brent's really good at building relationships, and sometimes, you know, that resonates with recruits a lot, and I think Todd Bates and Chavis have both really recruited um well, we'll see that this week when they yeah. go on the road. I yeah. think, I think, like you said, there might be a couple um, last minute, you know, trips that Brent makes or last pushes on signing day, last couple phone calls that might make yeah. some kids. When is when is official signing day? By the way, I don't want to say the exact date here on the pod and give people wrong information. So, uh, <laughs> but it's easily Googleable. Googleable. <laughs> um, great. So, um, we're gonna talk some OU hoops, actually. Um, yeah. I think Jason's gonna step off. Yeah, Jason, yeah, I'll let Jeff, our, out of here. We're gonna get we're gonna get Gracie Rawlings, our OU men's basketball beat writer, on the pod. We're joined by Gracie Rawlings, OU men's basketball beat writer. Gracie, what's going on? I mean, the Sooners got off to a good start this year. They're six and zero. Um, they had some really easy wins at the first part of the season. Really didn't face much adversity, but you know they got a good test against uh, then ranked. 23 USC so that was a good matchup and Otega Owe hit a nice little buzzer beater at the end to give him that um invitational win so I talk about that good. invitational how big of like I know we were all watching it but probably not as closely as you were but like how big were those wins for the team and like what has Porter said about just the invitational in general beating Iowa beating USC like how big was that for the team to come together and prove to like the nation that obviously they're ranked now number 25 so how big was that invitational for them yeah, I mean, it's huge. Like, that was the first time that uh, OU's been ranked under Porter coming in at number 25. So, obviously, for that team, that's a big uplift. But, I mean, Iowa was solid. They were a really quick team. And um, OU was able to, like, get back on defense and kind of stop the drive. So, that was good. And then, I mean, USC's just solid all around. They had some um, really good outside players and some guys that could make the three. And um, it was really nice to see OU also be able to kind of um, combat the – combat the three and shoot the three as well because I felt like that was one thing they've kind of struggled with in the early parts of the season is like making the three and so they were able to like put in a season high um, that game and so that was good to see yeah Gracie at what point obviously they're six and oh ranked for the first time under Porter it's been a huge start they won an invitational but at the same time they won a tournament last year early on Mm -hmm. and they beat number two Alabama last year and they almost beat Kansas on the road at what point are we gonna know? Yeah, they blew out Arkansas. yeah. At what point are we gonna know if this team is legit or not? Yeah, I mean, I think the start of the season has been surprising for everyone just after last year, but I mean, it's really kind of hard to tell. I feel like North Carolina might be a good, a good little matchup. I mean, of course, we'll have Arkansas, we'll have um, Kansas and Baylor and all of those teams. So I feel like once we start getting into Big Twelve play, is like obviously when we'll really start to see regular or before conference play is kind of a bit of a toss up. I mean, they're playing like teams like North Carolina and Arkansas, like I said, but they have also got matchups against like Arkansas Pine Bluff and Central Michigan. And it's like, you know, do those 30 point wins actually equate to like competitive uh, games against big 12 opponents? And I don't really know what the Ken Palm's looking like right now, but like, Obviously, like you just mentioned, outside of North Carolina and USC, Arkansas, and some of those teams, like their non-cons, not very, very strong. But conference play is definitely going to be strong, and it just got stronger with the addition of Houston and, and some other Big Twelve teams. How realistic do you think it is for this team to, um, you know, make mark make the NCAA tournament for the first time? Because I know a lot. That's a lot of OU fans is things with Porter. It's like this is year three. I know you wrote about it in your preseason piece, like. This is kind of a prove it year. How likely do you think it is that they pull out some wins in, in conference play that they might might not like be favored in? Yeah, I mean, all preseason we heard Porter talk about the team being like 
way longer and more athletic, which they definitely are. Like you see it from Javion McCollum and uh, even your like big man John Hughley, who's getting out there and like four for four on the or four for six on the season and on threes. Like they're definitely longer. They're athletic. They're faster. But I mean, it's just I don't know. It's kind of like difficult to say. Like besides USC, I haven't really seen them like face anyone who has like true depth and true like substance. And so it's like. Yeah, they might be able to go out there and compete, and they could possibly make an NCAA tournament appearance, but it's so early in the season, and they haven't played anybody that I feel like could kind of, like, demonstrate the potential. I mean, even USC, there were times when I was like, okay, this game's just going to totally get blown out because, you know, they're making careless turnovers and careless mistakes, and I feel like they still lack a little bit of discipline. And so I would like to see that develop kind of as the season goes on and I feel like if the discipline develops and um, the fundamentals develop maybe you know we might see a a tournament birth for Porter Moser and the Sooners. You've been obviously at the press conferences you've been talking to the players what's been the overall message as they've started out 6-0? Yeah I think it's just been like team 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 like they're all team oriented they're trying to move the ball you know you have uh, your offensive facilitator my Milos Uzan and also, I mean, like I said, J.B. McCollum, and they've both been really facilitating the offense. Um, and so I think their message has kind of been, okay, we're going to include everyone in the game plan and we're going to stick to Porter Moser's system and we're not going to steer away from it. And they're going to trust the process. And so I think that's kind of the message that they've sent throughout kind of the early games. Yeah, I mean, the message I've kind of gotten just by watching like a couple of games is, I don't know if Porter wins those close games against Iowa and USC two years ago or even last no year. Shot, like, yeah. I think the I think the knock I had on Porter last year was like, especially in some of those really close Big Twelve games, is he couldn't close. Mm-hmm. Uh, he really couldn't manage the game when it got close and well, those late game scenarios in the Big Twelve. So that's kind of what I've really seen. But um, obviously, coming up on Thursday, uh, OU takes on Arkansas Pine Bluff at McCaslin. Students only. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that and um, just how cool of an event that is and kind of like a story you're working on. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Mac- McCaslin game is super cool. Like, it's super exciting and a super neat opportunity for the students. I mean, they haven't played a game there in like 12 years. And so just for, you know, the university to be able to put on something like this and to kind of have your community kind of rally behind your team is like really special. I mean, there's so much, like so many cool moments that have happened there, cool basketball moments in history that's been made. And so I think just kind of those storylines kind of also play into the game. And um, I mean, like, it's just a great opportunity, especially since the Sooners started six and O, and like, they're just going to be able to kind of maybe get some fan involvement you know they've had a good start to the season they're getting to play this really intimate venue like maybe they can get some student involvement fan involvement kind of carry that into the rest of the season but yeah I'm working on a story um and it's been really fun I've got to talk to some former OU players who got to play at both um, McCaslin and the Fieldhouse and just kind of the stories that they've been able to like tell me about playing there and just like their experiences with like um, how special like McCaslin was just because, you know, people um, that would just rush in to fill the bleachers and basically people just overflowing to watch um, watch them play. And I feel like some of that has been lost because Lloyd Noble is obviously such a big venue and maybe not always like appropriate for like the the sooner like team that we've had in recent years, maybe. So. For sure. Maybe. Maybe we'll have you on later this season to talk more about the Lloyd Noble Center's developments. Yeah. Keep going on over there at University of North Park. But that's for another day. Gracie, mm-hmm. thanks so much for joining us. Thank uh, you. That, be sure and watch that McCaslin game and look out for her story on OUDaily.com. Should be, should be a fun one. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to get Jason back on here and talk some full outlook. All right, we're back on the OU Sports Podcast. We have uh, downgraded once more. We you. Got Jason back <laughs> in here. You tall. We've got, Humans. let's talk bowl games, um, because even though OU's regular season's over and they didn't make the Big 12 championship game, OU's still going to play in some sort of bowl game. Um, my preference would be the Pop-Tarts Bowl. I don't know if y'all still saw the edible mascot. Man. I kind of want to bite of that. Let's I want that. a bit, like, I oh, I was thinking about it the other day. Dude, have you guys ever had, like, those big, like, you get the, I'm trying to think of, it's called the, 
like the pop tart with like the marshmallow in the middle and you put it in the toaster and it tastes like a freaking like i don't know what it's called a s'more yes that's what i'm thinking of it (laughs) tastes like s'more is the best thing i don't know why we're talking they need to make that the the mascot because that's the best pop tarts Um, that's the best not that's a horrible pop tart no it's not it's amazing oh strawberry strawberry. yeah that blueberry Oh, brown, brown sugar cinnamon. Those are those. Hey, those are my three. Those are fire. Um. Anyway, it's the let's talk one. reality and uh, realistic <laughs> bowl matchups. Um. I think what we're universally, you know, around the country understand is that OU is in play for the Alamo Bowl yeah. in San Antonio. I think there's some scenarios that still exist out there for a New Year's Six Bowl. I think a lot of chaos has to go on. Yeah. Um. You would think Texas has to make the playoff. Which I think, um, I think it's still very possible. Yeah, I think some other things would have to go on. I think, you know, Washington would have to beat Oregon, I think. Right. Um, I think Bama would have to beat Florida Georgia. State would probably have even to if, lose. Even if Florida Bama beats State. Georgia, there's always the question of one lost Bama, one lost Texas. No, obviously saying, head-to-head. Does the committee like, yeah. show that they don't care about the regular season, or does the regular season matter? Well, that's not how it works. I know, I know. But <laughs> I think that stuff. there's that there are bull – you know, possibilities out there, but 95% sure that this team's going to be playing a Pac-12 team, probably Arizona, yeah. um, in the Alamo Bowl. It's a Guys, what a love to see a OU-USC if USC could have won a couple more games. But yeah. um, that's for another day. So uh, be, stay tuned on Sunday for after the championship games. We will get our bowl announcement here, and um, we'll have a press conference with Brent Venables most likely and probably – uh, the other coach, which if it's Arizona, Jed Fish, and uh, we'll have some coverage on that on OUDaily.com. But um, I know Le- Jeff Lebby's the talk this week, so um, you know we're gonna keep you up to date every second, uh, 24 hours, uh, seven days a week on that. So stick with OUDaily.com. Follow us on social media, guys. We don't have predictions to do. It kind of feels like a weird ending here, but I think OU might not lose this week. Oh, really? Yeah. I predict that's that bold, that's Lewis is going to sleep till 10 o'clock tomorrow. That's I my prediction. literally never done that. <laughs> I wake up at 6 a.m. every day. God, you're like my grandfather. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for watching this edition of OU Sports Podcast. Keep it with OUDaily.com. I'm Colton, Lewis, Jason. Bye. We out.